For me, education means to inspire people to live more abundantly, to learn to begin with life as they find it and make it better. Carter G. Woodson The Washington Georgetown Black community had witnessed the Missouri Compromise of 1820, the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, the Dred Scott decision, and the John Brown Raid. The Civil War, Lincoln's assassination, and the subsequent elections had decisively changed the situation into one of Jim Crow segregation. Whites and blacks were making the necessary internal adjustments to social situations, which were created by competition and conflict. These socially inherited accommodations grew up in the pains and struggles of previous generations and were transmitted to succeeding generations as part of the natural inevitable social order, a racially segregated society. The American Civil War ended in 1865 when the North defeated the South. The national political power of the slave owners and rich Southerners also ended. However, John Wilkes Booth's assassination of President Abraham Lincoln pushed the United States back into its old political intimacies. The Democrats were able to regain political control. Southern and Northern state legislatures enacted black codes to restrict freedmen's rights and maintain the plantation system. The Republican-controlled Congress responded to these measures by passing the three great post-war constitutional amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th that abolished slavery, guaranteed newly freed black people equal protection of the laws, and gave all male American citizens the right to vote, regardless of their race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The newly freed slaves got their citizenship and control of their lives, their families, and their churches during Reconstruction, but Jim Crow segregation oppressed them as much as did slavery. Education became essential to the freedom of black people, even though one could not use it for economic advantage. In November 1870, just five years after the Civil War, the preparatory high school for colored youth started in the basement of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. It was part of an effort by freedmen and newly liberated slaves to uplift their race through education and to develop black leaders to fight for a new future Supported first by means of private philanthropic funds, it became a public institution within a few years, preceding the establishment of public high schools for whites in the city. As the first black high school in the United States, the preparatory high school was intended to prepare students for further study from the beginning. The school fiercely resisted persistent pressures upon it to become vocational, commercial, or general. It taught Latin, and in some early years, Greek as well. Most important, the school and its reiterations, M Street High School and Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, instilled individual and racial pride in their students and in the District of Columbia's black community. For a period of 85 years, 1870 to 1955, Dunbar was an academically elite, all-black public high school in Washington, D.C., described by historian Rayford W. Logan as one of the best high schools in the nation, colored or white, public or private. As far back as 1899, Dunbar students came in first in citywide tests given in both black and white schools. Over the 85 year span, some 80% of Dunbar's graduates went to college, even though most Americans, white or black, did not. Most Dunbar graduates could afford only to attend the low-cost local colleges, either federally supported Howard University or tuition-free minor teachers college. However, those Dunbar graduates who attended Harvard, Amherst, Oberlin, and other prestigious institutions, usually on scholarships, ran up an impressive record of academic honors. For example, Amherst admitted 34 Dunbar graduates between 1892 in 1954. Of these, 74% graduated, and more than one-fourth of these graduates were Phi Beta Kappas. In their careers, as in their academic work, Dunbar graduates also excelled. The first black general, Benjamin O. Davis. The first black federal judge, William H. Hastie. The first black cabinet member, Robert C. Weaver. 
the discoverer of blood plasma, Charles Drew, and the first black senator since Reconstruction, Edward W. Brooke, were all Dunbar graduates. During World War II, Dunbar graduates in the Army included nearly a score of majors, nine colonels and lieutenant colonels, and one brigadier general, a substantial percentage of the total number of high-ranking black officers at that time. During its 1870 to 1955 period of academic ascendancy, Dunbar flourished in almost total isolation from whites. Its faculty, staff, and student bodies were 100% black. However, it was part of a segregated dual school system controlled by white officials who tried to get the school to move in a non-academic direction. These officials resisted the demands of Dunbar parents for calculus courses and better chemistry labs and instead casually destroyed the institution as an incidental byproduct of their reorganization of the Washington school system in 1954. The Dunbar history is written, but the future remains for us to put together. There are no instant formulas for use by practical planners. In fact, the history of Dunbar suggests that instant formulas by practical planners are not the way to quality education. What is needed is a sense of purpose, a faith in what can be achieved, and an appreciation of the demanding work required to achieve it. The flaws of Dunbar indicate that it is not necessary to find ideal people or an ideal setting, but does indicate that a dedicated nucleus of people is required in a setting where their dedication can be effective. The Dunbar experience provides some empirical refutation for fashionable statements about the necessary ingredients of a good education for black children. But the school is not a universal model. Part of Dunbar's strength was that it did not try to be all things to all people. The founders of the school intended it to be an institution solely devoted to preparing black students for college and the advantages derived therefrom. In that special role, it was unsurpassed. The early half of the school's existence showed what can be done and some of the ways that it can be done. It also demonstrated that some of the presumed prerequisites of a good education are not essential. What is important is to create and sustain an atmosphere of academic achievement and excellence.